First of all, thank you for spending your Tuesday night with us. Um, we're just really glad that you're here. And I know that many people spend a lot of hours on Zoom. So thank you for mm -hmm. wanting to learn more about Snake River Salmon and what the faith community is doing to restore them. Um, I'm Leanne Barris. I am the executive director of Earth Ministry. And um, before we get into the program, I wanted to just take a moment to acknowledge the fact that I'm in Seattle and I am on um, the native land of the Duwamish tribe. And Jacob, our presenter, is in Missoula, Montana at the moment, and he is on the native land of the Katuxna Nation. And if you want to know the land that um, you are on, if you haven't had the opportunity to explore um, where uh, the land that you are on uh, has come from, I just dropped a link into the chat that will allow you to enter your zip code or your address and you'll be able to get a better understanding of the history of um, the land on which you reside. But I think it's just important to acknowledge that and to ground ourselves in place and to honor the first peoples of the land in which we all live. Um, next, I want to encourage all of you who um, may not be as comfortable with Zoom to just take a minute to move around it a little bit. You'll note in the lower left corner of there is the all important mute button. And um, since we will Take some time to go through the program and uh, we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions, but until then, I encourage you to go ahead and mute yourself. That will help with ambient noise and background and prevent feedback. So um, if you do need to ask a question partway through or want to like flag something for us, please feel free to unmute yourself and say something. But for the bulk of the presentation until we get to the Q&A, please consider muting yourself. Um, in the upper right corner, you can switch back and forth between speaker view and gallery view. Speaker view will highlight who's speaking right now. That would be me, but for most of the Zoom, it's going to be Jacob. Um, but if you want to see everyone who's present, you can switch to gallery view and get a nice snapshot of everyone who is here with us. And we've got 15 folks here so far. And then last but not least, in the middle bottom, there is a great little button called the chat button. And as I said, I dropped in the um, native land link there, but that's where if you have questions that come up during the webinar, please feel free to type them in the chat. Um, right now it's a small enough group that I'm sure we'll be able to have a nice conversation towards the end of the presentation. But if things pop up and you wanna just remember what you wanna ask, please feel free to type that into the chat and you can see the questions that other folks are asking. So. I'm sure many of you have been on a lot of Zoom so far, so this is all old hat, but I always find that you know every time I assume that there's someone who this is a new thing, so it's always a good to just point out, point out the basics so we're all on the same page. Um, again, like thank you for joining this event. It's an Earth Ministry sponsored event. If you're not familiar with Earth Ministry, we are uh, a faith-based organization that empowers people of faith across Washington State to engage in environmental stewardship and advocacy. So we do everything from supporting congregations that want to green um, the life of their congregation um, in terms of worship and education and building and grounds. Um, we also engage people in advocacy efforts at the local, state, and national level. So help people testify at public hearings and go down and meet with their elected officials in Olympia and otherwise make um, the faith voice heard on issues that are important um, to the health and well-being of our communities and the environment. And so if you're interested in learning more, you can go to our website, which is earthministry.org, which I just dropped in the chat. And we would welcome to connect with both you personally and also with your congregation. Um, and some of you looking around are already actively engaged and for that, we're very grateful. So now you get these 
stop hearing me talk and get to the main event. And I want to introduce to you Jacob Schmidt, who is going to be presenting our webinar content today. And uh, Jacob was born in the desert southwest and then moved to Spokane to attend Whitworth College, where he graduated with degrees in peace studies and philosophy. And he be able, was able to put those um, skills to work, uh, uh, at working as an Inland Northwest organizer for Saber Wild Salmon. So he has a great deal of interest and experience and knowledge about Snake River salmon issues, which we're gonna talk about tonight. And uh, while he was in Spokane, he was a very active member of Salem Lutheran Church, where he also even served as an assistant minister for the congregation. And now he lives in Missoula, Montana, where he's going to graduate school. Um, he spends a lot of time out hiking in the mountains around Missoula, but also is attending classes, as one does when one is in graduate school, with the hopes of eventually teaching environmental history um, as a college professor. Uh, he's been on the board of Earth Ministries since 2017 and um, is just an ideal person to be able to bring to us um, the marriage of both faith and salmon and river restoration in a way that I think is going to be really meaningful to all of us. So with that, I will turn it over to Jacob and he will give us his presentation. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Leanne. And thanks everyone for, for turning out on a Tuesday night to talk about salmon and holiness. Um, I'm uh, uh, zooming in from, my wife produces some shows on YouTube for, for some folks. So it's kind of a home studio that I'm not as used to. And like the, the camera is soft source. So if it looks like my eyes are just going, not never looking directly at you, that's why there's a, it's hard to look at the camera and read my notes. But um, anyway, so yeah, I'm gonna be talking about um, this holiness of Sam and answering this question of are Sam and holy and, and what does that mean um, to us in the Pacific Northwest um, will be primarily in the, uh, the sort of start with just to give a roadmap and start with ecology, talk about economics and then talk about um, spend the bulk of the time talking about the spiritual significance of salmon um, before getting into the more uh, wonky current issues with it, um, which we'll not get into quite as deeply as I want to spend more time just really going into the the spiritual, you know, capacity of of salmon. And uh, we can cover a lot more of the technical stuff in the Q&A and Leanne can back me up with a lot of the what's going on right now. Um, so you're not just looking at me the whole time. I have some images to help us along. So let's see if that, you can see my a map there. All right. So that's just to orient us. This is the, the natural range of Pacific salmon. The, all the green areas are the inland places that they reach. And the darker blue is the parts of the ocean that you can find them in. Um, so for the most part, I'm going to be kind of reading off of a prepared thing, but um, anyway. So salmon are sort of the, they're the cornerstone of Northwest ecology. For tens of thousands of years, salmon have brought nutrients from the ocean into the high mountains of the Cascades, the Coast Range, the Olympic Mountains, the Alaskan Range, the Rocky Mountains, as well as mountains in Japan and Kamchatka. Uh, the towering forests of the Northwest from the redwoods of the California coast to the white pines of Idaho, the Sitka spruce of Alaska, they've all grown to the size that they are due to the uh, in part to the infusion of nutrients from from salmon. There's bears, eagles, wolves. Oh, advancing slides. Let's see. I got some images of those forests for you. Um, these are both in uh, north central Idaho. Both of these images, I think, are from the Salmon River. Um, yeah, so got bears, eagles, wolves, humans, hundreds of a hundred other species that all live uh, along these streams and out in the ocean survive on salmon. Um, the abundance of, of salmon is truly like remarkable and, and especially has been throughout history. This image is from uh, up in Bristol Bay in Alaska, but there have been all across the Northwest rivers used to look like this during salmon spawning seasons where the, the common phrase is that you could walk across the river on the backs of the fish um, just a just a remarkable mass of, of fish out there. 
there's one anecdote I love is that there's a explorer who is mapping the uh, the Keats River on the Olympic Peninsula. He said that the sound of slapping tails and feasting wildcats was keeping him up all night. Uh, he couldn't get any sleep because of just how much uh, life there was during the salmon spawning season. Um, out of all of the all the of gra the gravity's forces bring nutrients toward the ocean, only salmon and lamprey bring it back up. Right, so they're incredibly significant to the ecology for that reason. Here's a spirit bear in Vancouver Island with a, I think that's a humpy salmon, I don't know. If the, and then out in the ocean also they feed our, our southern resident orcas and then and other, and, you know, lots of other ocean going fish. So that nutrient distribution has an enormous economic value as well, right? So mentioning those forests, the heavy timber industry of the Northwest was had a that was like the sort of the second boom of the the western economy after the gold and silver rushes that is because we have those had those massive trees that were salmon that were fed on salmon um, salmon fishing boom soon followed the uh, the logging boom and uh, especially as the advent of canning uh, allowed there to be an industry outside of just subsistence where you could ship salmon from the northwest is being shipped around the world um, let's see Prior to the arrival of Europeans in the Northwest, which is around 1743, that we start having Europeans, that the Russians and the Spanish explorers coming this way, uh, native fishermen would harvest an estimated 16 million pounds of salmon every year from the Columbia Basin alone. And that's a sustainable amount that's, that's coming back each time. Um, the Northwest was the only place in, in North America prior to European contact where um, they had, everyone had enough to eat, enough to even build cities without having any agriculture. The only like sedentary population with no farming is very abnormal in the whole world. Um, but it's because there are these fish that fling themselves out of the rivers and provide for people. Um, so when Europeans arrived, they found the fishing camps uh, eager to share their catch. Uh, you find stories that all over in, in journals of explorers and first settlers. Um, even with the precipitous decline of salmon in the past century, salmon fishing in Washington still accounts for $240 million um, annually and provides for vital income for small towns across uh, north central Idaho and out on the Olympic Peninsula and all up the coast to Alaska and down to California. In places where logging once supported the local economy, today fly fishing guides um, and, and the lodging that uh, tourists stay at can, can make up some of the only businesses in a town. So a year with a bad season or a year without a season can be detrimental for these small towns. Um, salmon also bring in tourists like me, who, well, see, I got some more pictures here from, this is from our commercial fleet. That's friend Amy Grandin holding up a, a Chinook there. And this is, uh, that's the port in Port Angel, or, no, Port Townsend, where those boats are, are um, in port. Most of the boats in Washington go up to Alaska to fish though, because uh, it's where the fish are. Um, and then, yeah, people like me who don't necessarily catch fish out in the streams, just, I just have, will go to see them, right? Like it brings in tourism even outside of the fishing. I took both of these photos. The one on the left is at the White River up uh, in the Wenatchee drainage, right up by uh, Tall Timber Ranch. Uh, each of these little spots out there in the water is a sockeye salmon. And then the one on the picture on the right is on the Elwha River. This is near where the Elwha Dam used to be. You can't really see from the detail. I'm not a great photographer, but there are a few Chinook swimming in that pool there as well. Um, just that was really lucky last summer to get to watch spawning runs on two different streams. I'd highly recommend folks in the Wenatchee area to go up to um, up to the White River, up to Napequa Crossing. In actually, right around now is when they're when they're around. Okay, so where was I? So, so <laughs> my notes. All right, so there's just something amazing about watching these animals, just like the orca, right? The orca don't, we don't eat them and we don't, they don't provide any economic value in that sense, but they provide for a tourism industry just because people have a calling to them. People are drawn to them. So what is it about salmon? What is it about these fish that's so remarkable? And so I'd like to say, 
that beyond economics and beyond ecology, salmon have a sacred significance. Um, I believe that all of God's creatures have an inherent dignity, which confers on them the right to not be eliminated, regardless of their economic value or even ecosystem function. I think often in the environmental world, we can switch from economics to talking about the ecosystem function as a way to maybe humanize or, or make its less mechanical view of the world. But even still, I think animals that, that don't necessarily provide a major, major ecosystem function have a right to live and a right to, to survive. Salmon, I think, have a special significance even beyond that. Uh, I think to me, it's that they're unique amongst almost all the creatures in the world. Um, they're, <laughs> the cheesy line I had in my notes is that they're as rich in metaphors as they are in omega-3s. Um, they, so salmon represent the Eucharistic nature of all creation um, in their persistent self-giving. Uh, the Reverend Matthew Wright, who's a Christian theologian, writes primarily about the mystic traditions of the church and about mysticism in other faiths. Um, he was brought up to BC a few years back to speak um, and was invited to come out and watch the salmon spawning, reluctantly went, and uh, this is how he described his first encounter with the fish, um, which I'll just read from here. It says, the air reeked of dead salmon, and all around wings were flapping as gulls tore flesh from their carcasses and plucked out their eyes. And to my surprise, with a fierceness and a tenderness that seemed exhausted and inexhaustible, I heard the whole scene before me speak Christ's words at the Last Supper. This is my body given for you. I was dumbfounded. The few remaining living salmon beating their bodies against the current, saying to the young, this is my body given for you. Those who had the, finished the journey and were now dying, this, this is my body given for you. Those now de days dead as their flesh is torn out, this is my body given for you. I was standing smack dab in the middle of a living icon of the Eucharistic universe, Jesus our mother, as Julian of Norwich called him, and who knows this kind of self-giving better than a mother? Christ, our tired and exhausted mother and brother and lover and friend, speaking through every facet of the whole long, painful, and messy unfolding of creation. This is my body given and given and given for you. Brutal and beautiful and broken and whole, a circle dance of sacrifice without which life would simply cease to be. Um, just now back to, to my words. <laughs> See, like the eloquence will drop off a, a little bit. That guy's a, uh, one of my favorites. Um, so salmon are a sign of God's promise, right? They Given they give this annual sermon of selfless love by um, showing up in the same place each year, like just on the schedule to provide food for the community. Um, perhaps the most ardent defender of salmon's holiness, um, who I will quote from a lot through the rest of this presentation, is David James Duncan. Um, I think I actually had on the slides there, uh, this guy. Um, he lives just a little bit south of me here in Montana. Um, great writer, uh, fly fishing books and essays on salmon and politics and, and religion. Um, anyway, I'll go back to the salmon picture. Um, David James Duncan claims that, <laughs> uh, he claims that a diet of wild salmon will cure mental illness, unite the human heart with all of nature and inspire cold turkey abstinence from network TV and partisan politics. <laughs> he calls these remarkable fish divine gifts created in an unending beginning and a product less of evolution than of unconditional love. Um, pretty strong words. Uh, <laughs> he says he has a lot of trouble getting published in newspapers because of that. But um, so the salmon are this, uh, this symbol of, of, of selflessness, right? That they reward those who wait by the river, confident that the runs will return. And the salmon asks very little from the fisher, simply that she not block the stream and in response to the selfless giving of the salmon, we are to express our gratitude by not taking too many in a given year or to leave enough for those upstream of us. We should protect the waters of our home. Uh, the Northwest Catholic bishops uh, put together this letter back about 20 years ago and, uh, in which they described the waters of the Columbia of our common home as a sacred commons. Uh, the Columbia River and its tributaries are shared by everyone and thus also the responsibility of each to steward for the sake of all. Now, over the past century, we as an American community have taken more than our share. We've dammed our upstream neighbors and we've poisoned some of the rivers of life in our region. Um, 
So it's been speaking mostly to a Christian context so far, but outside of the Christian context, uh, there's a spiritual nature of salmon that's, uh, that's been recognized for millennia. Um, let's check the chat. Okay. Um, Okay, thanks. Um, so, okay, where was I? Sorry. <laughs> uh, the tribes of the Northwest each have a different story for the beginning of their tribe and the beginning of the world. Um, it, it'd be wrong to conflate all of them as having the same background, but there are some things that they all share. And one of which is uh, the central nature, like that salmon play a role in the creation story of, of pretty much every Northwest tribe. Um, many of the coastal tribes um, have, uh, have, a, have the same story to it. I actually have here in my notes that in the Christian creation story, we also have uh, fish, or at least mentioned in Genesis, right? It says the waters were teeming with living creatures. Um, so there's, there's certainly something there. And um, okay, so for the Salish speaking tribes along the coast, and I have a picture here of some Salish fishermen for that. Uh, this is actually Spokane Falls, this etching um, from, I think this is one from like 1880s or so. Um, anyway, for many Salish speaking people, um, the, their story includes this, this bit where the, the people, the humans who are new in the, to the earth are, can't, haven't found food for themselves and they're starving. And the salmon, uh, the salmon people, which is like the, each of the, creatures are represented as a tribe it's like the salmon tribe approaches them and then the salmon chief offers to sacrifice his son to feed the humans the human tribe right so the sacrificed child's bones are then placed in the water down at the at the coast probably right at the mouth of the river and the young salmon is resurrected from the bones in the water so that sacrifice um like that that uh that story is repeated every year by the tribes in their first salmon ceremony, where the first salmon to be caught by the tribes is, uh, is taken and distributed to everyone. Everyone has a small piece of the first salmon, and then the bones are placed back in the water so that the salmon can be resurrected the following year. So it's this sacrificing of a son and a resurrection story in that. Uh, for the Nimipu, the, the Nez Perce tribe, uh, it's their origin story has the uh is is fun is anyone anyone might have been down to the the heart of the monster down near Kamii, idaho um that's the the place where this happens but there's the story of this monster who's devouring up everything in the world and then uh it's the coyote um goes and is gets himself eaten by the monster and cuts his way out and saves everyone from inside the monster and then flings the pieces to the edges of the of the earth, which is the spreading out of people of different types around the world um, and giving them their names. But the interesting thing with, with this story, their creation story, is it always starts, every telling of it starts that Coyote is out at Celilo Falls fishing when he hears the monster. Uh, it doesn't necessarily add to the plot of the whole thing, but it's significant enough to note that like the creator of of the world though like the coyote is um is, is just out fishing that's that's what he's doing when he's alerted to these events right um so for native people uh in some cases they would even say that it's the salmon that make the rivers sacred the salmon have a way of consecrating the places that they are uh sherman alexi of the spokane tribe wrote that his mother could no longer see the spokane river as a sacred place since the salmon are gone um he also Looks, has several poems where he looks to the future with a mix of hope and rage. Um, in one poem, which I'll put a link in the chat when I am not juggling two screens, um, that to a, a, him reading this poem uh, called The Powwow at the End of the World, he says that, uh, uh, that with the return, there will be the return of, this, of the salmon, who has, the salmon who has three stories it must tell before sunrise. One story will teach us how to pray. One story will make us laugh for hours. The third story will give us reason to dance. And I am told by many of you that I must forgive, and so we shall, when I am dancing with my tribe during the powwow at the end of the world. 
So he's envisioned the sort of the end of the world as as when the f salmon finally return and restore the rivers. Um, so one important lesson to draw as well from a broader indigenous worldview, I get from a professor of as indigenous studies um, and Chicano studies, I think at the University of Oklahoma, named uh, Dr. Dan Wildcat. Um, he writes about shifting our perspective um, to think to, to a world in which what he think he calls indigenous realism, recognizing that we live among relatives and not resources. Um, this is to quote, this is quoting from, from him. Uh, most of humankind talks about resources because the worldview guiding the powerful economic and political interests operates in those terms. This terminology is overwhelmingly anthropocentric and selfish. Hence, other than human life is dominated by resources. We must promote a worldview where the natural world is full of relatives. For in so doing, the logic of rights becomes blatantly incomplete without a counterbalancing of rights with responsibilities. A counterbalance to the one side, fixation on individualist inalienable rights with an affirmation of indigenous notions of in and unalienable responsibilities is desperately needed. Let's start a discourse about living well responsibly and respectfully with relatives. This is not romanticism. This is indigenous realism. Um, so I've been talking about this um, as if uh, with like a kind of mournful tone in, in some ways. So what happened to salmon? I mean, it's maybe a familiar um, account to most folks, but um, why, why make this appeal at this time? So in short, a series of dams have been built throughout our region that block some block salmon passage entirely. Um, let's see, there's one on the lower snake. Um, this map that I started with that, the orange areas are places that have been cut off by human activity. The dark blue are where salmon were cut off by natural barriers. And then the blue is where they can still swim to. Um, and it, can't is also Canada included, but um, anyway, where was I? Um, so overfishing, urban population, clear, oh wait, sorry, uh, even the, yeah, overfishing, clear cutting, uh, urban pollution, all these things had already taken a toll on salmon runs before the first dams were built. Hello. But, well, oh, hello. Hi. <laughs> um, I made it. My leg. So shaking. <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, where was I? So, but yeah, so once uh, one by one, these dams are completed, they transformed uh, river habitat, pushing some species to extinction and others right to the edge of it. Um, the last of the major federal dams to go in on the Columbia and Snake Rivers were four dams uh, between Pasco and Lewiston. Those are the lower Snake River dams. Those went in the 1950s through the 70s. Um, so despite warnings from the tribes, the state fish and game agencies and, and others about the impact that these dams would have on the Snake River salmon. The Corps, Army Corps of Engineers pressed on and finished Lower Granite Dam in 1975. Um, these dams are outfitted with fish ladders, but they still create a system in which there's a slow and hot series of reservoirs for 140 miles where there used to be a cold free flowing stream uh, that disorients the juvenile salmon on their way down to the ocean and can kill the adult salmon on their way upstream from the, in the heat of the summer. Um, just as all of the groups that warned about it predicted, we have seen a slew of extinctions and uh, decline of the remaining fish on the snake in the snake basin. Um, the right of treaty tribes to fish and sustain themselves is protected by law and upheld by many court decisions. Um, if you remember from, I've been teaching an American history courses this semester. So uh, President Andrew Jackson promised to the, all of the tribes of North America that, that our US treaties would hold up so long as the grass grows. That's something that he said there. Um, but uh, so a study of the impacts of the Snake River dams on native people uh, that was conducted uh, in, back in 1999 uh, concluded had this, I think it's just a really poignant phrase. It says, uh, present tribal suffering stems in large part from the cumulative stripping away of tribal treaty protected resources to create wealth for non-Indians of the region. In earlier decades, bureaucrats working to convert 
the river to produce electricity, irrigate agriculture, carry commodities by river barge, and accommodate deposits of waste, asserted that the uncertainty regarding impacts on salmon could be managed as the, conversa as the conversion of the river moved forward. So they proceeded thinking that you know, these impacts would be managed. Um, I think 20 years uh, since, uh, well, so wait, sorry, I'm reading my notes wrong. Um, 20 years ago, as Catholic bishops uh, sent that letter to Northwest uh, leaders and agencies urging them to consider, and I'm quoting from it, consider scientific studies, community needs, and ecological impacts in making decisions which are ultimately political, but which much stem from a spiritual and ethical base. Um, we have seen five federal salmon plans fail to recover salmon over the past 20 years, and I think that's fairly good evidence that the bureaucracies in charge cannot seem to manage the resource in the way that they promised, or the relatives which are under their um, uh, guidance. That's why we're looking for uh, new leadership, which Le Leanne will speak more to after this. Um, so concluding, I'm going to end with some quotes from David James Duncan. Um, he has written extensively about sort of how much of a tragedy it is for the Northwest to lose the salmon um, and how much it'll Im it impacts our community life. Uh, so quoting from him, he says, when these blessings no longer come, the Northwest's living image of self-sacrifice goes silent. No more sermon. As a father of three kids to whom I'd love to pass down the faith that their hearts are, are the faith that their hearts are heroic and their souls immortal, I find the silence of salmonless rivers very hard to bear. He speaks further of our obligation to protect and restore salmon in distinctly Christian terms. He saying, as a fisher myself, I owe it to Peter, James, and John to try to safeguard our line of work. <laughs> And then finally, this uh, image from his uh, essay, Our Salmon Holy, he says, uh, when I see some raggedy gambler in a riverside casino with a liquid addiction in one hand and a smoke in the other, shoving quarters into a poker machine, defying loan sharks and ruin in hopes of bringing a little wow into his life, I think there but for industrial greed and Satan stands a fisherman. <laughs> um, so... Uh, and then a final David, James, I can't put enough David James Duncan quotes in this. Apparently, I put a lot of them in my notes. Is he uh, says, "In this bewildering, oh, sorry, there's a fire in water. There's an invisible flame hidden in water that creates not heat but life. And in this bewildering age, no matter how dark or glib some monetized, spiritually inert humans work to make it, wild salmon still climb rivers and mountains." in absolute earnest, solely to make contact with that flame. Words can't reach deep or high enough to embody this wonder. Only wild salmon can embody it. Um, that is what I have for the presentation. I'd like to hand it back to Leanne. To... Wonderful, thank you so much, Jacob. That was just really powerful and meaningful and I even, learn some new things about uh, the, the history of this region and the, the tribal uh, legends that surround the salmon. So thank you for that. Um, one thing that we wanted to do before we open it up to questions is to give you all the opportunity as people of faith to put your faith into action for the faith. And as Jacob mentioned, there is a current thing that you can do now that will make a huge difference in setting the stage for the next uh, level of focusing on river restoration and salmon recovery. Um, as Jacob mentioned, um, one of the options for restoring the Snake River dams is taking a look, uh, restoring the, the Snake River salmon is taking a look at the dams on the lower Snake River. And we understand that if those dams were to come out, there are conversations that the region needs to have about how to mitigate for the impacts both the dams are having right now on the salmon, but then also if the dams were to come out, there are some river users that are currently gaining some benefit from those dams. And what we've been doing as the faith community has been um, 
trying to bring people together to start having those conversations. The science is clear that in order to restore the salmon, the dams must go. But we in the faith community care as much about the people of the Northwest as we do about the salmon. And so we are calling on our elected officials to host a stakeholders table and a stakeholders conversation that will bring together farmers and fishermen and native people and faith communities and community leaders to a single place where all the needs of the Northwest can be met. Um, you know, because as, as Jacob mentioned, there's barges that go down the river and farmers need to get their crops to market. But if you actually talk to many of these farmers, they care more about actually getting their crops to market than the conveyance by which they do it. So if we can make investments in rail infrastructure and highway infrastructure in a way that will allow them to get their crops to market quickly, easily, and affordably, then the dams become super superfluous. But those are the conversations we need to be having and we need our elected officials in the Northwest to be, um, very cognizant of finding the funds to increase our investment in the needed infrastructure if the dams were to come out. So all of that is preamble to say that right now the four governors in the Northwest are launching exactly that kind of stakeholders process. There was a preliminary process that happened just in Washington at the beginning of this year, but now the entire region is coming together. And we have a faith community letter to Senators Murray and Cantwell to asking them to support this process. And I'm dropping a link in the chat. Um, if you follow that link um, right now, you can actually see some background information about exactly what we're asking. And there is a letter that uh, we are going to be delivering to our senators um, later this fall, probably post election time when people can tend to focus on things that aren't campaigning. Um, and we want to see our senators not only support the stakeholders process, but whatever product comes out of that is going to need funding and congressional support. And so we're asking them to help bring people to the table to have the conversation now, but then putting them on notice that we are going to be looking to them for leadership um, once uh, a package deal comes out of that process that will actually restore the river and recover salmon and by proxy orcas, which depend on the salmon, we're going to need to seize legislation in Congress and support um, at the highest levels to ensure the funding for um, those elements. So I encourage you to add your name to this letter. Um, Please share it in your congregations and in your networks. Um, as you mo all know, on the east side, your voices are gold. I mean, I live in Seattle. The senators, they hear from people in Seattle all the time. They don't hear from people in Spokane and Wenatchee and Medical Lake and Leavenworth and all of the places where, you know, you all have just as much or even more of a stake in this than people in Seattle do, but they don't hear as often from a diversity of constituents. And so I encourage you, you're like the triple word score in Scrabble, right? Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> You know, one Eastern Washingtoners were three times a Seattleite, maybe more. So please sign the letter and um, we will be able to deliver that to them later this year. Um, so with that, we do want to open it up to questions. I know that you probably have some burning, um, burning inquiries for Jacob. And I do want to flag that Janet asked early on, Jacob, the fabulous quote about the theologian talking about the Eucharistic nature of salmon. Can you remind us who that was again? Yeah, um, that's a guy named Matthew Wright. And I will drop the link to his, uh, some of his writing in the chat is a, there. Um, just uh, some really great thoughts on all sorts of things on, I recently wrote one on uh, uh, anger in politics and has some other things about learning from Buddhism, learning from Sufi Islam, these things, and how he's incorporated these different practices and stuff to, into his theology. Really brilliant guy. Um, 
Right. And then the other uh, thing I was going to drop in here it is is uh, let me just pull that up. This is a reading of uh, powwow at the end of the world that Sherman Alexi did with uh, the with the Upper Columbia United Tribes. Um, just some imagery from their salmon ceremonies alongside that. It's, it's really good. Um, although he does call for the Grand Coulee to be knocked over, which is not a policy proposal that Earth Ministry uh, has endorsed or will. <laughs> um, but but he's a poet, not a not a politician. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. What questions do you all have for Jacob or uh, for, for me for that matter? And you, just, you can feel free to type in the chat and actually we do have a small enough group that you're welcome to unmute yourself and just ask your question out loud. Yeah. Well, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, how do people feel about the recently completed uh, federal EIS on the whole Columbia River system? There was hope that maybe they'd really address removal of the four dams on the Lower Snake, but it's just a whitewash, not unexpected, but uh, it sounds like it kind of seals the fate of those dams to continue limping along for the next 10 or 15 years of trying all these methods to save the runs that have not worked in the past. Yeah. Is that Jacob? Um, sure. Yeah, I was uh, in some of the hearings over the summer and whatnot. And it's, uh, I mean, you pretty well correct there. The, um, so for folks who don't know, that was, there was an environmental impact statement that was uh, put out by the um, federal agencies responsible for the Columbia River hydropower system. Um, the, was the final one just came out, I think, a couple weeks ago, and they um, uh, they were sent back to the drawing board with this in the first place after uh, their federal plan was was ruled inadequate um, and illegal. So inadequate to to meet the requirements of the Endangered Species Act, um, and thus illegal. Mm -hmm. And so they um, came back with basically the same plan that they had in two thousand and eight, which at the time was ruled inadequate. Um, there's a few small changes to it, which are almost exactly just the text of court ordered injunctions um, from the Ninth Circuit. So it's again, it's just the it's the bare minimum to meet a legal requirement. And from some folks who've worked in that regulatory environment that I've spoken with, it's actually not even the bare minimum. I spoke with a guy who worked in, um, uh, in for the uh, Department of Transportation, and he said that that was just the way that that environmental impact statement was conducted, like from the get go attempts to you to negotiate with the Endangered Species Act rather than abide by it, which is just the, an approach that's guaranteed to land you back in court. Um, it's kind of regardless of how you think this should be managed, it's really agencies not following the law and sort of using the court process as a tool to, of policy to knowing that they're going to go back to court and lose again, but that the most that the court will ask them to do is take another five years to draw a new plan. Um, it's a really cynical use of, of the, the letter of the law to, to abdicate responsibility for, for actually managing the system. Um, and not that they haven't made changes. They've like, were nothing to be done since 1990. They, we wouldn't have any salmon in the Snake River now. They've done, some improvements, but but yeah, it, when it comes to endangered species law, um, time is not something that you have to to just play around with. Um, and the yeah, their their experimental improvements, these like fish passage systems, um, are somewhat effective, but not very cost effective, and they take a lot of time to know whether they will be effective. So there, um, it's not too much hope from the from the agencies there, but that's where. The, the our move has been to to shift to looking at our our Congress people right um, to make it abundantly clear to them like these letters we've been sending recently have that uh, that you can't defer this responsibility you can't abdicate this responsibility that um, it's something has to be done someone has to take 
that leadership role and, and call for some real changes. And, you know, the first step to that, like Leanne said, is getting the op to, to remove the op anticipate and remove the opposition by um, meeting people's needs. It's like, well, what do, how do we need a power grid? We need a transportation system. We need um, all these things and the salmon need a river. How can we have all of them? I, and they're certainly not an unsolvable puzzle just requires leadership and buy-in from, from everyone. Um, yeah, and, and Dick, I'd point out, like I've been working on this issue for, since 1995, and I've seen six federal salmon plans thrown out as being inadequate to restore the salmon. So, you know, it, it's just rinse and repeat of the same story. And as Janet pointed out in the chat that, you know, delay in the court, this will be litigated, right? Like this is yet another plan that fails to restore salmon. And so there is already, you know, movement to litigate this new terrible salmon plan. But the fact of the matter is delay is killing the fish and we need to move faster. And that's one of the reasons why the stakeholders process is trying to take things out of the hands of the federal agencies and faster than the court by actually bringing people together to talk about what might be possible, right? You know, if we, if we can broker a Northwest solution that all the different parties agree to, then the the, gov the federal government won't be able to say no if you've got farmers, irrigators, fishermen, uh, you know, Congress people, communities, Lewiston, Idaho, you know, the Port of Lewiston is interested in having this conversation. That is a watershed moment, right, mm -hmm. to, to have these people willing to come to the table and talk. So, you know, focusing on a collaborative approach rather than a litigative approach may be the only way we can move forward. And, you know, I, I have faith that, that we can try to get there. Yeah. Janet asked about the Elwha dam removal success to give us hope. I think that's a, that is a good place to look. Um, if you're not familiar, the Elwha River is the it's been considered for like one of the great best salmon rivers um, in the Northwest. Uh, and the dams were removed there in 2012, two large dams. They both provide like the engineering example of how a large um, dam can be removed. Actually, the Snake River dams are a less difficult engineering problem because they're in such a easier to access location. They're not a steep, narrow thing in a canyon. They're um, fairly wide. Um, they're built to be um, removed in a way that half earth and half concrete design. Um, so there's the engineering aspect, the fact that it shows that the salmon do come back even to areas that they have been blocked from for a hundred years. Um, and then, which is one of those things that we've had stories from native folks about testifying to for a long time, but it's always good to also have contemporary proof that, um, <laughs> that other folks will believe. Um, that, uh, and then they also, it also is helpful for, for how that sort of process can go. There was a lot of opposition. The the permission to to or like the initiative to remove the dams on the Elwha River came in the in the eighties and the nineties. Um, it took a long time for the project to get funded and planned and everything else, um, but it eventually did go through. And I think one thing I look at with it is um, how did you get Port Angeles to buy into removing these two dams that were um, in their uh, right outside their town. It's a uh, one way that they did is that there's Port Angeles, Washington has one of the most sophisticated water treatment plants in the world. <laughs> um, the, they got that as a, as a gift, you know, sort of buying their, their goodwill in a way. But uh, there were people there were understandably worried that all of this silt that had been sitting behind the, the dams would come down and, and wreck their water system. And so part of the deal was building them uh, a water treatment center. I, I think that kind of, uh, you know, th those deals are, are they made and like that doesn't seem to hurt, doesn't hurt anyone. And, you know, it's using our, pooling our resources toward better things and figuring out what people's concerns are and how to, how to meet them. I think, yeah, it's a great example there. Um, 
it's definitely changed some minds, I think, in legislatures as well. I hear about the LLA anytime we talk with folks about it. Uh, okay. yeah. I, I've got a question. Yeah. Uh, your, your map showed natural blockage. Yeah. Blockage from dams and also natural blockage. What is the natural blockage that it's referred to in those? Yeah. Those so Spokane Falls is one. Um, Shoshone Falls down on the on the Snake near Twin Falls, Idaho. Um, okay. There's some debate with some of them uh, because, and and it's changing with geology. You'll find um, like landlocked salmon species above areas that they don't get past anymore and things. Um, so yeah, those are the natural blockages would have been places where a lava flow cut off a river or, or erosion changed the created a, a steep waterfall. Like there probably used to be salmon in the Palouse River further up, but before Palouse Falls became a 150 foot waterfall. Um, things like that. Thing I find fascinating is that um, salmon dip into a little bit into Montana and a little bit into Nevada on those older maps. Um, pretty amazing. They used to catch salmon at the silver mines in North Nevada <laughs> before the Hell's Canyon Dam complex was built. Um, not many, but there were some fish that made it up there. Other questions for Jacob? Keep them coming. Yeah, Janet, go ahead. Here, let me. I just, I just have one question on that map. Maybe you could go back to the map somehow. And I and I don't know um, exactly what dams we're talking about. I assume there's some of the yellow spots on that map that we're asking to come down. Okay, Is it so... that big yellow one kind of at the end of the Snake River thing? Is that one or? Oh, uh, yeah. No, so that's a. Uh... Uh, I think that's Dwarshack Dam that that's showing there. Um, tell you what, I will. Well, you have a pointer. That's awesome. You can point at the ones. I'm going to pull up a better map. <laughs> okay. And then, uh, and then I'll pull the screen back up. So the they're Not between Pasco and Lewiston. Yeah. Right. Um, what were you saying? You go ahead. I was just going to like while you're pulling up a map, I was going to say that it is between uh, the Tri Cities and Lewiston along the snake river so so this is right with the tri-cities here richland pasco kennewick the first is ice harbor there the second is uh lower monumental which is in here somewhere there you are lower monumental and then little goose dam uh just past the palouse river near palouse falls uh, is little goose and then finally, um, Lower Granite Dam, which is this one here, um, which I'll mark Y so you can get a point. So there's Spokane and Seattle for full context. We're talking about this stretch here. Um, yeah. So four dams on the snake. Yes. OK, thank you. So there are. Um, in each of those, those are the, the lower snake dams. They have fish passage, but change the nature of the river such that the, they're detrimental to the migration. Um, the further up on the snake, uh, in the Hell's Canyon complex, there are a series of three dams that don't have any fish passage. Um, Grand Coulee is another, Grand Coulee and Chief Joseph have no fish passage either. The tribes in Spokane, the Upper Columbia tribes are working on fish passage projects with Bonneville Power at Grand Coulee uh, and the reclamation there, but don't know as much details about, but um, there's definitely some interesting things going on with, with the tribe there to try and bring salmon back into Spokane, um, at least as far as the reservation, um, but not in a ceremonial capacity. Um, the short of a really massive infrastructure project you couldn't bring back like enough for a, a kind of like a commercial harvest or something uh, in Spokane, but enough for a few members of the tribe to catch, to have his first salmon ceremony on the reservation. Uh, that's the goal. That's, 
anyone quantify the number of salmon? I know that's like magical numbering, but if those four dams came out, what are we talking about in terms of poundage or number annually or, you know, after 10, 10 years or something? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a great question. I think you could probably just look back to what it was in the, at least in the six, 1960s or so, maybe in like the mid period between the dams being built to, to estimate, because there are a lot of other factors, right? Like the climate has, has changed, the ocean uh, is more acidic, there, there are other aspects to it, but, um, but I, I bet it would be similar to what it was in the 60s. I don't have a number on that, but at the moment, like this year, the season uh, for for salmon fishing on this lower or on the Snake and its tributaries was cut off in uh, was it in May or or April? Land. It was extremely early. It was right at the start of the season. So if you're a fly fishing guide in Orofino, Idaho, you just were looking for another job this year. Um, so I think uh, any is a is any more than there is is a, is what we're hoping for. Um, I think an important thing to keep in mind is, is that there was a sustainable harvestable fishery on the Snake and Columbia River prior to these four dams going in. People always say, well, if you're talking about taking out these dams on the Snake River, why aren't you talking about taking the Columbia dams out as well? And no one's talking about that except, you know, outside of, you know, a handful of tribes that would like to see the river restored to its complete and full natural glory. But the, the, the fact of the matter is, is there was a sustainable, harvestable, both commercial and sport fishery with the four dams on the Columb River in place that were all built in like the 1930s and 40s. Many of them were part of the WPA and the, you know, the New Deal um, uh, construction. But the four dams on the Snake River were all built between 1962 and 1975. I mean, within all of our lifetimes on the Zoom right now. They were built in our lifetimes. And you can actually see the graph of the populations plummet after that. And it's the combined effort of having to go through eight dams, four on the Columbia and the new four on the Snake, both coming and going, that has decimated these salmon runs. Yet, if we were to take those dams out, we've seen models that show the fish will come back right? And right now, yeah. like e even now, there's a healthy um, uh, uh, Hanford Reach Ball Chinook salmon run that is, you know, uh, that spawns in the Hanford Reach right near the Tri-Cities. They go through the four Columbia dams and are healthy and happy. And there's a, a burgeoning, you know, sport and commercial fishery on those fish. But once you add in the four dams, it's the Snake River fish. They're every single species of salmon and steelhead on the Snake River is either extinct or endangered. And it's mm -hmm. these four dams. But the models show, just like with the Elwa, if we were to take these dams out, the fish would come back. Yeah. There's, um, oh yeah, go ahead, Terry. I was gonna say. I just, just to remind us, Jacob, was the, the purpose of the dams, was it power generation? Was that the main purpose? I know the barging came in, but I mean, what was, I had, I had no idea that these dams were that, all that new, all, like you say, Leanne, I mean, from the time I was a, you know, a, a young teenager to graduating from college, basically, that's when they came in, and that, that's mm -hmm. just really surprising to me, so we do have a lot, you know, there's a lot of living memory about, probably about what was there, so my question is, what was pressing about it to have them built, was the population growing and needing power, or what? Yeah, the um, the book to read for sure, if you wanted to know the whole ins and outs of all the, the politics of it, is called uh, River of Life, Channel of Death by uh, Ken Peterson, I believe, which is a really extensively researched, was it? Keith Peterson. Keith Peterson, that's right. A really extensively researched book. But um, short version is, uh, I mean, if you, uh, is that the barging to Lewiston had been uh, getting boats to Lewiston had been a desire of, of local politicians, local people in the area for, for as long as Lewiston's been a town. They used to run steamboats, like stern wheelers up the snake, running class three and four rapids upstream. Um, it's called Ice Harbor because it's where you would pull over to avoid the ice flows coming down in the winter. Um, so when there is gold 
coming out of the gold mines in in the in the Clearwater that was coming they were loading it on steamships to come go down to Portland and um as soon as like wheat farming took off there they built like grain elevator like grain um like cantilevered um like uh tramways to lower grain into the canyon to load onto boats throughout um but it's really difficult to run ships up those rapids and so for a long time like half a century local politicians had been pushing for some measure to from blasting out the rapids to um damming up the river as some way to get more reliable transportation to lewiston um the railroad companies built lines along that corridor but with the railroad monopolies they were charging more than the farmers could afford so the farmers backing like local politicians like herbert west who was the mayor of walla walla in the 1940s um really lobbied for damming the river as a means of of forcing competition on the railroad monopoly um looking back on that it's like i really wish you could have just used some of the antitrust laws or something to to, to put price caps on grain trains something other than changing the fundamental shape of the river but yeah and then once they were by the time they were being built so they'd been pushed around for a long time they'd been approved for decades before they were actually ever funded um projects that get mothballed like that and then eventually picked up and funded are, are hardly ever good um <laughs> but they uh by that time the whole the technology for hydropower was vastly improved and so that became a multi-use project um although in terms of hydropower they are fairly low producing because they're provide for barge traffic because you're if you wanted to really provide a lot of power you need a huge um, elevation drop but the more elevation you drop you have at each dam the more difficult it is to build a lock to be, to bring a boat upstream so they're kind of conflicting and like they can work together um in the engineering but there's a certain limit to how efficient of a hydro dam you could build that still works for barges um so they provide about four percent of the of the hydropower in the region between three and five depending on the the flows whereas grand coulee on its own is like 35 percent of washington's power uh, that was a long-winded so, response to that but hello this is Dave Duncan. Am I on? Yeah. Can, I, yes. can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hello. Uh, anyway, as someone who lives in the Channel Scablands, it's uh, kind of neat to see the Missoula Lake Shores right behind you on your on your video that uh, thing there. Uh, yeah. The Snake River Snake River was still running when I first came up here after I got out of the Navy in 1974 uh, and went down to Naval Reserve meetings and. Clarkston. So it was still running at that point. I got to see it when it was dammed and the only way up it was the up the hill was the old skyline with line highway. Uh, there's a, a question I've got, well several questions. One is have they really looked at the potential uh, fish loss that's going on on the Snake Rivers from the discharge of potlatch uh, paper company thing right at the uh, uh, confluence of the two rivers, it, it, confusing things. I know they said it dismissed it from as being a non-issue, but I find that hard to believe based on how much water they discharge and what the discharge looked at uh, when the water was drawn down in '91. Uh, at, and also, I'd have other questions, but uh, that would be one I'd ask. And is that you know another one would be uh, some of the new uh, uh, fish. A technology, the whoosh machine or the uh, fish cannon that they're working on uh, getting fish over dams that maybe even be able to get over Grand Coulee and Chief Joseph. Are those possible? And are there ways to enhance the the waters behind some of the dams like Dorshak Dam that has, uh, there's not enough nutrients in it to provide uh, good uh, growth for fish, but some of those could have been nursery lakes for sockeye. All right, yeah, that's a, that's great, Dave. There's a lot there. Um, <laughs> thanks for the really. Sorry, you don't, have, you don't oh, have. Oh no, to I can. I I can speak to a couple of those things. I don't know anything about Potlatch Paper Company, and I did I skip over those sections of the environmental impact statements because they're so long, and I stick to what I <laughs> what I knew and 
was working on. Well, the issue, the issue there. The issue there is they put out a tremendous amount right at the confluence, right at the Washington border, and they get a, at least used to get away with all kinds of stuff because they were regulated by EPA, but they were basically just charging into Okay. Anyway. Um, yeah, I think um, what I think what I'd, I'd say to that, just as far as sticking with what I what I do know, I don't really know too much about. I know I know what plant you're talking about, and uh, and I've yeah, definitely seen it there. But um, is that our folks with the Columbia Riverkeeper have been bringing Clean Water Act cases against uh, against the like with the EPA and with um, Bonneville and the Corps of Engineers. So I, it's probably somewhat covered in those cases. I know they've been doing it with around temperature more than anything, but um, all these other regulated pollutants are, are part of that. Um, but talking to some of the other questions, like those, the whoosh technology, the, those salmon cannons, the, the fish tubes, um, really neat technology actually invented by, um, I think, Washington irrigators that uh, developed those. Um, and they've started to implement those in some like high dams in smaller rivers places like the Clealum River, I think they might have been playing around with that. Um, thanks, Janet. Um, see ya. And, uh, uh, but, and potential for Grand Coulee or Chief Joseph. I think there is potential there. Um, I, I don't know the engineering quite exactly, but um, for the snake dams, of course, they already have um, fish ladders and downstream like bypass systems. Uh, very complex, expensive machines, but we're still seeing the fish declines. So, um, but yeah, they, that technology could be helpful toward toward what the tribes are working on, on getting fish into the Spokane for ceremonial harvest. Um, last question about reservoirs and for sockeye rearing. I know, uh, who was it? That it's, it's Sean or Scott? Anyway, I'm gonna forget the guy's name. Biologist for the um, Spokane tribe has worked on a lot of modeling of, of the lake beds, like in Lake Roosevelt and Dwarshack and, and other places for how well they would work as for sockeye rearing. Um, I'm not the biologist and or geomorphologist or anything, but um, it seems like that is the case, right? That like, even though there didn't used to be a lake behind Grand Coulee, now that there, there is one, it could actually benefit a restored sockeye run, a reintroduced sockeye run, if they brought sockeye in from, from say Lake Wenatchee over to um, Lake Roosevelt. Um, there's potential there, and I think the tribes are interested in pursuing that. Um, but yeah, um, I think that was most of it, <laughs> David. This is Thank great you. questions. Yeah. Let's see. You're muted, Leanne. <laughs> muted. Ah, oh, I hate it when people do that, and I just did it myself. I apologize. Um, asking whether there's any last questions for Jacob as we're wrapping up. I put the link to the uh, salmon letter back in the chat and encourage you to click on it and sign. If you don't get a chance to do that tonight, if you're on a phone or an iPad and want to look at it later, you can also access it from Earth Ministry's website, uh, which is just earthministry.org. And if you go to our rivers and salmon page, you'll see a link to the uh, letter straight from there. But um, it really will be, would be great to make your voice heard. And we ask you to sign on if you're able. Yeah. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say, if you do want to, learn more things I didn't answer. Um, Save Our Wild Salmon It's good people who work there. Leanne and I both used to work for them at a different time. Um, they're all, any of the emails you find on their website, they'll probably answer your question or you might be able to just find an answer on the on the website for, for more of the technical questions. Um, and you need to see, you know, last time I was in Spokane at a salmon event, someone, I think from the Lands Council brought up the idea having a rally for more rail and I think that that's a great idea uh, in the future just throwing that out there that um, instead of a uh, that in order to take down the dams we're going to need new transportation systems and we want more 
trains going from Eastern Washington to Seattle and Portland to carry freight. So I think it's a good way to frame it um, in a way that our Eastern Washington legislatures, uh, legislators can, can get behind. Um, so there might be some kind of rally for more rail in the future when rallies are happening. But anyway. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for joining us and big thanks to Jacob for a powerful presentation. Really appreciate uh, your expertise, Jacob. Thank you for sharing it with us. Thanks for having me. This has been great. Thanks for coming out on a Tuesday, everyone. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. <laughs>